<coughs> Welcome to the lecture uh, for research methods. We're talking about the first part of chapter four of the APA manual. Uh, getting down to kind of the mechanics of APA style, the, the nuts and bolts stuff. A lot of very specific rules uh, in this chapter about mechanics. And I won't cover everything that's covered in those pages because I'm confident in your ability to, to read. Uh, however, I will address those rules and situations that, that students commonly struggle with and some of the things that the manual may be uh, a bit vague on. Okay, uh, looking at uh, punctuation in terms of spacing, as a general rule, after punctuation marks, uh, a single space. So after a period, a comma, a semicolon, uh, and even uh, after, a, after a colon, one space. And many of you, I uh, know I was taught, after a colon you space twice. Uh, that may be for other styles, but not for APA style. Um, why? I don't know, because they say so. Um, However, some exceptions to the rules. Um, if you have internal periods, there are no spaces. Um, I'm, this is, I'm talking about for uh, abbreviations. Uh, for example, you know, if I said you know the largest military installation in the free world, i.e., Fort Hood, you know, uh, after the uh, the period uh, in, in i.e., which is abbreviation for it is for for that is right. There's no space between that period and the e. And then the E, the period, there's no space between that period and the comma. But then after the comma, there would be a space. But internal to the uh, abbreviation, there, there's no spacing. Okay. Um, and then uh, at the end of a sentence, <laughs> APA now says, uh, go ahead and, and put two spaces. Uh, so you get the end of the sentence, period, space, space. Uh, but the, I think the last manual, they you know, forever it was two spaces, and in the last manual they said, oh, one space, because we want to save paper, and then I guess they realized it wouldn't save that much paper, uh, and it makes it harder to read, uh, um, so they say, go back to doing the, the two spaces, because it makes it easier to read. Um, for for me, uh, for that particular rule, it's kind of silly, and they go back and forth, and it doesn't make a big difference. Just be consistent. Always do one space, or always do two spaces. To be current with APA style, do two spaces uh, after punctuation at the end of a sentence. Um, okay. In terms of spacing uh, between lines, uh, double space everything, right? Just set your document to double space. Don't hit return at the end of each line, like you would with a typewriter. Um, some people do that. I don't. I don't know why. If you do that, uh, it may look fine uh, when you first do it. But then if you go back and edit, you're going to screw up your spacing. So just uh, let the word processing software that you use wrap the text around. Right? Don't hit return at the end of a line. Let it just wrap it around. Double space everything. Um, simple. Uh, in terms of uh, periods, obviously, at the end of sentences, but um, in terms of using them with abbreviations, you got some, some weird stuff. Uh, obviously, for some abbreviations, you, you do use them, like all your Latin ones, e.g., i.e., and you don't have spaces between the internal periods. Uh, but then you don't, use a you don't use a period in an abbreviation uh, for any states, so the TX for Texas, it's no periods there, or um, for... Uh, capital letter acronyms and initialisms, right? So APA, uh, SWPA, NATO, anything like that where all the letters are uh, capitalized to, to in their, the initials of something. Uh, no, no periods in those abbreviations. Uh, and then also not for uh, terms of measurement. So uh, centimeter, foot, second, you know, CM, FTS, no periods. But there's always exceptions to the rule. For uh, the abbreviation for inch, which is IN, you do put a period. And, and it does make sense why they have an exception. Because if you don't put a period, it looks like the word IN. Um, so that's why you have to put the period to, to make it help people realize that, that it's the abbreviation for inch and not the word IN. Okay, okay so pretty simple stuff there. Uh, in terms of uh, elements uh, of a series, <coughs> Uh, you use commas to to separate those. So all the stuff we're talking about commas, um, and sometimes people uh, in other classes, other styles, you don't put a comma um, before the conjunctions. You do red, comma, blue, and yellow with no comma there, because people say, oh well, you have the and, you don't need a comma. Uh, APA says you need a comma, and I think it all, I think it makes it clear uh, um, to have a comma there uh, as well. So put commas between all parts of a series, including separating the last one uh, from the conjunction in the final part of the series. Um, when we talk about which and that clauses, right? Um, 
so don't use commas for uh, that phrases right which those that phrases we call restrictive clauses uh, so something like uh, the materials that were not included in a restrictive clause indicates that uh, in this case I use that on of commas that some but not all of the materials were included right whereas if I used which I would then have to need a comma so the materials which were not included so that whole clause is set off from the rest of the sentence by commas um, and I'm indicating that um, none of the materials were included rather than just uh, some of them so it's not just a different word. A different word, having the commas there or not, makes the meaning different. So if it's a that phrase, if it's a restrictive clause, uh, uh, no commas. If it is a restrictive clause or a which phrase, you set it off from the rest of the sentence using commas. Okay. Um, obviously, with conjunctions, uh, you put it before the conjunction. You know, blah, 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 blah to the end. But she said, and for some reason, people... Uh, most people do this pretty well, but they forget about uh, when but is the conjunction they're using. If you have two independent clauses separated by a conjunction, you need a comma. Now, if the two clauses aren't independent, then uh, you don't maybe not maybe don't need a comma. But if you have two independent clauses, they could each stand as a sentence on their own, but they're connected by this conjunction. You need a comma in there too. Okay. So uh, that being said, let's look at uh, two things. Which of these two is correct? So the dog ate all of the food and drank all of the water. The dog ate all the food and drank all of the water. And those look pretty similar, right? But the only difference is in the second one you have an it in the second clause, right? Which means that it uh, has two independent clauses. So the second one is punctuated correctly. The first one is not. In the first one, you don't need a comma. So the dog ate all the food and drank all of the water. The dog did two things. Here, because then you think, okay, well, don't I have two independent clauses there? No, because the first one is the dog ate all of the food. Independent clause, fine. So, okay, is the, is the second one independent? Drank all of the water. No, there's no subject to drink all of the water. There's nothing in that, right? The subject is back in the other part of the sentence. Um, so you don't need a comma there. For the other one, I have the dog ate all of the, all of the food, which is a complete sentence, and then it drank all of the water also could be a complete sentence and it's an independent clause and therefore it does need a comma so uh, of these two the second one is punctuated correctly the first one uh, would be fine to be worded that way you just need to lose lose the comma okay, um, okay. looking at uh, semicolons uh, frequently use them to separate independent clauses right. and again the two clauses must both be independent just like with a uh, common and conjunction separating two things, they have to be able to stand on their own as complete sentences. So here I have an example. Each participant read only one story. Each story described two interactions. Right? So often uh, a semicolon, you think, well, if I could replace it with comma and, would it make the same sense? If so, you're probably using it correctly. If not, you may not be using it uh, appropriately. Um, the other thing we frequently use uh, semicolons for are uh, when we separate elements of a series where one, at least one element of the series has internal commas. I've right? this before. So we have participants were asked to okay, do a bunch of stuff. To read a story about a girl, three bears, and a kangaroo. Okay, so that's one of the things. So I have commas in that element of the, of the uh, series. I've got more stuff to come, so the rest of it has to be separated by semicolons. Semicolon, write a paragraph of the story, semicolon, and draw a picture about the story. So here, write a paragraph about the story isn't a complete sentence, right? It's not an independent clause. But it doesn't have to be because it's part of a series. Okay. Uh, so, again, if you have... Another way to think about it is if you have just two clauses separated by uh, semicolons, they better, be, uh, they better be complete sentences on their own. If it's more than two, if it's three, then it's probably a series, and it may be okay as long as one of the elements of the series has internal commas. Uh, colons... Uh, can be uh, a little confusing, I think. Um, primarily used whenever you have an introductory clause and an illustrative phrase, right? So, uh, some introductory clause and then a final phrase that illustrates, extends, or amplifies the, the preceding thought. Okay, a couple of requirements for you to use a colon in, in this case. The introductory clause needs to be grammatically complete. Right? You should be able to stop at the end of the colon and have a complete sentence. Right? So that what comes after is just illustrative, it's just extra. It, it's not needed. The first part can stand uh, on its own. And then the illustrative phrase, the part that comes next, may be a complete sentence 
or it may be a dependent clause. It can be either way. But the first part has to be a complete sentence. The second part doesn't have to be. Uh, if it is, uh, then you need to capitalize the letter after the colon. Otherwise, you don't capitalize the letter after the colon, only if that uh, illustrative clause is a complete sentence. Okay. So looking at these two, exa two examples, uh, three possible outcomes suggested by the theory are men will become more aggressive, men will become more passive, or men will become emotionally dysregulated. Okay. So uh, we look at that, we've got uh, the introductory clause is three possible outcomes suggested by the theory are. Okay. Is that a complete sentence? No. I mean, I've got, uh, the, my, the subject is uh, outcomes. You know, there's three of them. They're possible, but it's outcomes. And then uh, suggested by the theory is also uh, a phrase that's modifying outcomes. So it's not a verb or anything. I've got outcomes. My verb is are. So outcomes are, there's no predicate, right? There's no rest of the sentence. So I don't, I can't use a, a colon there. If I had a complete uh, sentence there, um, then uh, uh, it would have been okay to have a colon, and the next part would have been fine. Having a capital M for men would have been fine because I have uh, uh, three complete sentences uh, following that. Right? So, but the first one, not correct as it's written. The second one, the theory suggests that at least three distinct outcomes are possible for how men will change. Colon, one space, become more aggressive, become more passive, or become emotionally dysregulated. Okay, so I look at, the, is that introductory, introductory clause a complete sentence? So, okay, the theory suggests that at least three distinct outcomes are possible for how men will change. So, uh, the theory suggests that, uh, da, 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 da. so again, uh, the theory suggests that the outcomes are possible. Okay, so now, and then for how many will change is another uh, kind of an essential phrase. So I've got basically, uh, the theory suggests outcomes are possible. That's a complete sentence. And then I'm going to say what those outcomes are next, but I, I don't have to. Right? So here the colon is fine. I don't capitalize because the uh, uh, illustrative phrase is not a complete sentence. So the second of these two is correctly punctuated. Okay, uh, looking at quotation marks, when do you, when do you use them? Uh, double quotes whenever uh, you're using slang, uh, an invented uh, ex uh, expression, or trying to uh, uh, convey a sense of irony, but not if you're using uh, technical terms. <clears throat> so if I said, you know, the successes of aggressive children, so here, trying to be ironic, saying, okay, well, like when aggressive kids get their way, you know, they get the lunch money. So I may be referring to their successes, but really I'm trying to uh, convey that that's uh, a sense of irony here, that it's not really success because in the long run it will lead to failure and problems, what have you. Um, so trying to communicate that with the quotation marks, that would be an appropriate use. Uh, but then if I had uh, some children, uh, you know, characterize some children as having a uh, disorganized defiant attitude. So this disorganized defiant attitude, uh, it may be an invented expression, I may be the first one to, to come up with that uh, phrase, but it's a technical term, <laughs> so it doesn't get quotes, which I know seems a little silly, but uh, yeah, that's APA for you. Um, okay, if, uh, if you mention the title of an article in the text, um, you set it off with double quotes, uh, but you won't do this very often, right? Um, you, it's more likely you'll do it if your entire paper is a literature review or a meta-analysis, and you're talking about some some similar article. You know, the most important article ever published on this topic was, you know, uh, Perry's da 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 da. But generally, we don't do that. We don't talk about the titles. We just talk about the author and the year, and we cite the work, and they can look at the title in the back. So as a rule, steer clear of putting the, or, the title of an article in your paper. Uh, but if you do. It would go in quotes, uh, but that's for articles, uh, notably not for titles of books, magazines, uh, or movies. Uh, instead, those are italicized rather than uh, put in quotes. Um, and of course, if you're quoting something from another source and you're obviously citing it, putting the page number, you'd also want to put uh, quotation marks around it, assuming that the quotation was uh, 40 words or less. And if it's more than 40 words, then you go with uh, that uh, blocked indent quotation, and you don't need the quotation marks. Um, 
in terms of uh, the, the single quotes, right? Um, use those when you have a quote where the author is quoting something, right? So you're quoting something, and in what you're quoting, they had quoted something inside of that. So double quotes on the outside, single quotes on the part that uh, uh, they quoted. So that sounds a little funny, so looking at it. Uh, so according to Haynes, 1998, uh, these children failed to recognize that their success is temporary. So here, we know that uh, I'm taking these words from Haynes, but when Haynes had the sentence in uh, in her his article on page 24, uh, the word success was in double quotes. So now if it comes into my paper, and I'm quoting something they quoted, put quotation marks around, and they probably did it using it as uh, to indicate irony, it, it turns to single quotes. Um, and then in terms of the in punctuation uh, quote, um, the the in punctuation doesn't go inside the quotation mark. You notice in the sentence above, at the end of that sentence, uh, or the temporary is the last word, right? But there's no period inside the quotation marks. The period goes uh, after that, after the uh, page number in the the parentheses. Okay. Um, okay. A couple other uh, random things. Uh, you can use uh, dashes to to set set off non-essential cause clauses. Basically, you can use them uh, like uh, commas, set off a non-essential clause. Uh, it's okay to use it once in a while. Just it's not something that you want to overuse. It can be a bit uh, distracting. Uh, so here, you know, the stimuli chosen, uh, and then some non-essential clause, because basically the sentence is the stimuli chosen were presented, blah blah, blah in some fashion about how how the stimuli were presented. Right? But I'm adding to it to tell you a little bit about the stimuli in this non essential clause. One designed to elicit fear and one desi designed to elicit sadness. I could have used commas to set that off, but if you want to make it look a little different, a little style thing, throw in uh, some dashes. To, to make the dash in most word processing uh, um, softwares, you hit uh, the hyphen key um, twice uh, and then it'll turn it into a, a dash. Um, in terms of uh, using parentheses, most often you, you'll use them uh, with citations, right? If you're setting off uh, a year or an author, author's names uh, in the year of pub in something's published or page number, it'll be inside parentheses. Uh, then you might also use them uh, with uh, abbreviations. So if you have, and again, if you ever use an abbreviation, you know, for like uh, the National Institute of Mental Health or the American Psychological Association. Uh, whatever, the first time you use it, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, DSM-4, before you can use the phrase DSM-4, you have to say the whole thing, right? Diagnostic Statistical Manual, 4th Edition, Text Revision, parentheses, DSM-4-TR. And after that, you can use the, that, that abbreviation. But the first time you use an abbreviation, you have to spell the whole thing out. When you do, you set off the abbreviation in parentheses. Uh, and because of that, sometimes you have... Uh, well, you would have the collision of parentheses, right? And and basically, what happens if you where if you have two things where you would have parentheses collide, you put a semicolon where they hit. So, in a study published by the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, you know, so I said something. Uh, they reported blah 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 in a study, right, by the NIMH, and. Uh, if I didn't uh, have my semicolon, I would have uh, parentheses in IMH for the revision, closed parentheses, open parentheses, Johnson 1998, closed parentheses. And rather than having these two back to back parentheses, you can just imagine those parentheses dissolving into each other and turning into a semicolon. So anytime you see, if you're typing and you have two parentheses running into each other, go, oh, whoops, turn that, turn that into a semicolon, and you're good to go. Right? Same thing if you have uh, multiple. Um, sources for one sentence. You don't set each one off in their own set of parentheses. You put them all inside one and separate them with, with semicolons. Right? Uh, if you're going to have uh, nested parentheses, uh, it's a little, uh, it's backward from the way, uh, at least I, I learned it originally. I always learned, you know, especially in, in, uh, in math, you have your uh, brackets on the outside and then parentheses on the inside. APA style, uh, opposite, because they're contrary. Uh, so if I had, you know, uh, assessment instruments, blah, blah, blah. For example, so I'll set off in parentheses this, this EG, the personality assessment inventory, and I'm also introducing the abbreviation so I can use it in the future. Instead of having uh, parentheses, open parentheses, PI, close parentheses, close parentheses, I've got nested parentheses here. So for the internal ones, the ones around PAI, turn them into uh, uh, brackets rather than uh, parentheses, which again, uh, may be opposite of what you were taught. It's definitely opposite of what I was originally taught. Uh, and then uh, slash, uh, 
not many instances to use a slash. Don't use it for or like he or she. You never do he slash she or she slash he. It's that's not APA style. Uh, and well, I can't I can't think of many good examples where you would use a slash. And I'm sure there are some exceptions, but in general, you're you're not gonna need that. You you would use the word or uh, in most cases where you think you would use a slash. Um, okay, before we move on to some stuff about spelling, just kind of a final note on grammar. Uh, if you're using uh, Microsoft Word, and uh, maybe some Mac software stuff does this too, but I'm not familiar. I know Word, uh, if you have a grammatical error or a spelling error, a uh, little squiggly line, right? For spelling errors, red squiggly line. For grammatical errors, green squiggly lines. Um, pay attention to those, but don't be uh, a slave to those. Oftentimes, the green squiggly lines in the, the the recommendations of Word to fix your grammar are consistent with the APA uh, style. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes if you're doing something that's APA style, it'll give you the green squiggly lines because like that eh, doesn't look right. But just because Word isn't the same thing as uh, APA style, and it doesn't come up with all the changes in the manual. So uh, when you have a little green squiggly line, look at it, think about it but don't necessarily change your sentence to make that green squiggly line go away because you might be doing APA style correctly. But then don't ignore those things. 80% of the time, uh, they're right and you got something wrong with your sentence. Okay, moving on to spelling. In terms of the uh, uh, definitive sources for how to spell things, uh, Webster's Collegiate Dictionary or the APA Dictionary of Psychology for some of the psychological terms that wouldn't be in the dictionary. Um, so, uh, if you spell something and you say, well, I found it on the web spelled like this, but it's spelled differently in one of these other sources, your spelling would be considered wrong in the eyes of APA. Um, in terms of uh, using spell check, again, uh, usually spell check is right, except for, for names. Uh, but uh, uh, spell check isn't always right. You can't just uh, assume spell check has is, is got your back, right? Like if you wanted to have this sentence spelled, oh, if you stand on top of the mountain, you can see for miles. Well, if you write that, you can see four miles. Spell check would go, yep, you spelled that right. Good job. But you didn't mean to say four miles. You mean to say F-O-R, four miles. Right? Uh, so spell check won't catch uh, things that you misspell that way. And Or if you autocorrect, sometimes people will autocorrect to the wrong word. So, again, listen to spell check, but it's not uh, uh, omniscient. Um, plural forms uh, of Latin and Greek words uh, can be tricky, and the, the thing that people start with most often uh, is the word data. Data uh, is a plural word. Not It's not the data is, it's the data are. Okay, data is plural, treated as a plural. Uh, and rarely would you use the singular of data, datum, uh, one point of, uh, of data, uh, rare. So get used to thinking about data being a plural word, even though it doesn't end in an S. Okay. Uh, possessive plurals ending in S. People trip up on these still. Um, whenever uh, we have a, a, a word that is uh, made plural by adding an S and it's possessive, then you just have apostrophe after that S, right? So the participant's energy level. How about the energy level of the participants? More than one participant. Right. If it were one participant's energy level, the apostrophe would go before the S. Right. But since it's more than one, the S makes it a plural. The apostrophe goes after. So we don't have S apostrophe another S. Okay. Uh, if we're talking about uh, Anna and Sigmund's uh, Freud's uh, me Freud media, like Freud is the word. Uh, we're talking about more than one of uh, the Freuds. Uh, we add the S to make it plural. So again, it's S uh, apostrophe. If we're talking about just uh, one of them, like Anna Freud's, Anna, Anna Freud's preferred uh, approach to psychoanalysis, it's apostrophe S, right? And that's pretty straightforward. Where it gets a little screwy, you got somebody named Mathis. Uh, now, Mathis is this, right? So one person named Mathis, and if we're going to make that possessive, we do add an apostrophe S. So it is S apostrophe S, which you try to avoid with your plural stuff earlier. But if, again, the S here didn't make it plural, you do add the apostrophe in an S, and it's not just an apostrophe after it. And if you add uh, more than one Mathis, how do you make that plural? The Mathis says, 
right? And then if it's, if it's uh, going to make that possessive, now we've added an ES to make it plural, and we just put an apostrophe after that S, the Mathis's family reunions. Okay? Um, so just keep an eye out on, on those things. Hyphenation. Um, check the dictionary if you're unsure if a phrase should be hyphenated, or maybe just one word, or maybe with space. So like high school, as a noun or as even as a modifier, like high school musical, high school dance, no uh, no hyphen, and there's a space between the two words, and that's because we've used the word so much in our language as a, a, a mo modifier that's gotten put in the dictionary, uh, and then horse shoe, the shoe of a horse, that's one word with no spaces, right? But then uh, eye opener, why well, that was a real eye opener, that's a hyphenated word. You know, why does one get a hyphen and one doesn't? Why does one run together? I don't know. But over time, we've we as a society, as a culture, uh, some smart English people uh, agreed. Uh, okay, we're gonna make this word look this way. It's in the dictionary. You gotta do it that way. Okay. Sometimes stuff isn't in the dictionary, right? Especially if you have uh, temporary uh, compounds, things that don't often go together, but you're putting them together for a brief while. Uh, when that happens. Uh, you're usually doing it uh, to, to modify something. You're using two words together to modify some other word. Right? So it's a compound modifier. And there's a couple of principles to keep in mind. Generally, you hyphenate if there's a possibility of uh, misreading. So here's something that's not correct. And you can see that it could be um, misunderstand, uh, misunderstood, misread. Uh, the adolescents resided in two parent homes. Right. Now, if there's no hyphen there on two parent, because again, homes. What type of homes? Two parent homes. Right. Where two parent is a phrase together. It's a compound modifier that modifies homes. If the if the hyphen isn't there, if it's not hyphenated, then I think was well, that two parent homes or is that uh, uh, what type of homes? Parent homes. How many of them? Two of them. Right. You don't know which one is kind of ambiguous. So you hyphenate if, if it would help clarify what you're talking about. Uh, and then also, uh, as a general, if you have a temp temporary uh, compound as a modifier, you hyphenate if it comes before the target, before the thing it's modifying. Right. So if I have an oxygen-enriched environment, what type of environment is it? It's not an enriched environment. It's not an oxygen environment. It's an oxygen-enriched environment. Right. And using, you know, like if I said, you know, it's a a tall blue house. It's not tall blue, it's, it's a tall house, and it's a blue house. Those separately modify the house. Here, uh, oxygen doesn't modify the env environment by itself, and enriched doesn't modify it by itself. It only modify it together, and so you've got to link them together with uh, a hyphen if they precede the target, if they come before the thing they're modifying. If they come after, all of a sudden we don't need it. So environments that are oxygen enriched. <laughs> then you no longer need uh, the hyphen. Okay. Uh, and then the other time that you don't need a hyphen is generally if you have uh, adverbs working together. So uh, a slowly moving car. Again, it's not a slowly car, <laughs> but slowly is modifying uh, moving. It's not uh, communicating one idea. It's it, the car is moving. How is it moving slowly? Right. Whereas back before, it's not an enriched environment. How is it enriched? It's oxygen enriched. No. Oxygen enriched is one idea. Here, slowly moving isn't one idea. It's two ideas. It's moving, and it slowly is modifying the moving. Same thing with uh, better prepared soldiers. So if you have an adverb and an adjective together, uh, it's not a, con not, not a compound modifier that's going to need a hyphen, even if even it pre precedes the, the target. Okay. Uh, other times when you think, well, do I need a hyphen? Do I, do I not? Often we wonder with prefixes and, and postfixes. So like. Uh, one of the most common ones we see, post-traumatic, post-traumatic stress. There's no uh, no hyphen there. It looks a little weird with those two T's together, but uh, that's, that's the way it is. Um, so as a rule, um, when we have prefixes, you don't have hyphens. You just run the stuff together. right? So uh, post-traumatic, anti-war, uh, but there are some uh, some exceptions. If uh, the word has uh, uh, two uh, two vowels, right? Where not putting the hyphen there could make it really hard to read. So co-occur, it would look like cooker, <laughs> right? So uh, in that instance, you put a hyphen there uh, to to separate it. Or if um, 
the the base right there's a prefix and there's a base if the base is uh, capitalized or um, a, a number um, then you hyphenate so pro Italy just because Italy is capitalized uh, you put hyphen there. If there were to have been anything else like pro war, pro football, well, not professional football, but you know, as if as if and you were for football, the, the pro football people, people who are for football, that wouldn't be hyphen. That would all be one word together. Okay. Um, and then if you have a common base and you're going to modify with more than one thing, right? Um, you put a, a kind of a hanging hyphen there. So if we have uh, finishers, and the, there, what kind of finishers? Second place finishers and first place finishers. And then rather than being kind of redundant saying first place and second place finishers, I can drop uh, part of the modifier there and say first hyphen and second place finishers. And you know to fill in in your mind the word place goes with uh, first because um, you have the, the common base with two, uh, two compound modifiers uh, right back to back. Um, oh, one uh, one other note, just kind of a, a weird thing. Uh, looking back up at, at co-occur, uh, again, if you have two vowels together, generally you put a hyphen, <laughs> with the exception, always exceptions, uh, for the prefixes pre and re, like re-experience, uh, you don't need a hyphen uh, for that apparently, but uh, I've seen plenty of articles put it, especially looking at P PTSD symptoms, talking about the experiences of re-experiencing. Uh, uh, I've seen it uh, put that way, so this is, that's really kind of a gray area, and I, I personally probably wouldn't take points off if you put a, a hyphen on it, as long as it's clear. You know, as long as somebody reading along doesn't stumble and go, "What what word is that?" You're probably um, punctuating it correctly. Uh, and the the last thing. Pretty much anything that has uh, a phrase that has self in it is going to be hyphenated. Self-esteem, self-imposed, self-loathing, uh, self-concept, all of those hyphenated. Whether or not it's just uh, acting as a noun, if it's a modifier, whatever. Whenever there's self, there's a hyphen. With the exception, self-psychology, which is a field of, uh, a subfield of psychology. Self-psychology, not hyphenated. Pretty much any other phrase that has self in it going to be hyphenated. Okay, Okay. so we've talked about uh, a lot of stuff. So, summing up, keep the manual handy. <laughs> and, and, and again, you know, don't try to memorize every little rule and all the exceptions. What you want to try to do is try to understand the reasoning behind the rules. You know, and that it's all about uh, clearly communicating what we're trying to communicate. And if your writing uh, is clear and it's easy to understand, then you're probably following the rules uh, intuitively. That being said, keep the mail handy when you're writing and look stuff up when you're not sure. When you have kind of a, anything that's a non-standard sentence, what's well, not simply uh, you know subject, verb, uh, and predicate. If you've got a, a semicolon, maybe a colon, or you got a series, uh, what are the rules affecting those things again? Let me look it up and go back and, and look up the appropriate place. Okay, uh, that's all for now. Take care.